Welcome to this meeting of the Adlai Stevenson Center on Democracy. We are assembled to hear China's Consul General at Chicago, Zhao Jian. His diplomatic career is distinguished. Most recently, he was Consul General in Melbourne, uh, Australia, uh, before, was before coming to Chicago. His presence here is a tribute to Chicago and the Midwest region. Nothing is so vital as China's relationship with the United States and beyond. When I uh, visited China in 1975, the people were impoverished and repressed. They didn't dare talk with uh, strangers on the street. Now China's economy exceeds the US economy. The IMF predicts China's GNP to grow by 7.9% this year, though some companies are moving production out of China. The treatment of the Uyghur workers is a subject uh, the Consul General uh, will, may address, I hope will address. In brief, the peace and prosperity of the world depend on cooperation and a friendly relationship between China and the United States. Our speaker is well suited to address the subject of the relationship between our mutual countries. He has ably served his. So I, with that introduction, I give you Consul General Zhao Jian. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Senator. <laughs> uh, Honorable Senator Adlai Stevenson and uh, Mrs. Stevenson, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Um, let me start by thanking Senator Stevenson for his kindly uh, 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 for his kind inv invitation uh, to me to today's event and for his warm introductory remarks. I would also like to thank the Stevenson Center for its effort in organizing this event so that we can have this opportunity to meet each other online and discuss the, the past, the present, and the future of uh, uh, China-US relations. Uh, Senator Stevenson is an old friend of the Chinese people. He was a member of the first US congressional delegation that visited China in the early 1970s, not long after our two countries broke the ice in bilateral relations. Uh, in 1979, China and the U.S. formally established diplomatic ties. Ever since then, bilateral relations had kept moving forward against all odds and uh, scored historical achievements, bringing enormous benefits uh, to the two countries and peoples and contributing significantly to world peace, stability, and prosperity. However, in the past few years, China-US relations experienced the worst setbacks since 1979. We are now at a critical juncture in this relationship. Our two presidents, uh, President Xi Jinping and President uh, uh, Biden, uh, had an important phone conversation in February, charting the course for the relationship. And we had the anchorage a dialogue in March, which kicked off our face-to-face high-level talks in the COVID-19 era. Uh, but we have noted also that the new US administration has uh, described China as its most serious competitor, and the US continues to interfere in China's internal affairs, including Taiwan, Xinjiang, and Hong Kong-related uh, matters. To be frank, the current US government has not really stepped out of the shadow of the previous administration in shaping its China policy and has not found the right way to engage with China. 
Hence the questions, what kind of Sino-US relationship we should build going forward and how to make it sound and stable. Um, so with these questions in mind, I would like to uh, share with you the following um, points. Uh, first, we need to have correct understanding of the importance of China-US relationship. Senator Stevenson, uh, during our communications, I think Mr. Uh, Senator Stevenson has mentioned that uh, the China-US relationship is more important now than ever. Indeed, as the world's two largest economies and the permanent members of the U UN Security Council, China and the United States, working together can make great things happen for the good of the two countries and the world. When they are locked in disputes, uh, however, it will definitely spell disasters for both sides and the larger world. Closer economic cooperation between China and the US will create more development opportunities for all of us. And the world will be in a better position to more effectively deal with global challenges like climate change, transmissible diseases, terrorism, and transnational crimes if our two countries step up communication and coordination. Six years ago, China and the US working jointly helped conclude the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, last month, our two countries issued a joint statement addressing the clim climate crisis and President Xi Jinping attended the Leaders Summit on Climate at the invitation of President Joe Biden. All this has demonstrated the joint commitment of our two countries to meeting global challenges together. Uh, second, we need to respect each other and seek common ground and uh, peaceful coexistence while shelving differences. The Shanghai Communique of 1972 explicitly stated that uh, there are essential differences between China and the United States in their social systems and foreign policies. Yet the two sides agreed that countries, regardless of their social systems, should conduct their relations on the principles of respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states, non-aggression against other states, non-interference in the internal affairs of other states, equality and a mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. China never exports its development model or seeks ideological confrontation, nor does it ever seek to challenge or displace the United States. China is not the US enemy, nor its security threat. The development of China does not mean the fall of the US. In the context of market economy, there are some competitive aspects to China-US relations, but it should be a healthy competition for excellence and a greater contribution to world development and prosperity rather than the wrestling uh, to beat each other. The future of China-US relations hinges on whether the US can accept the peaceful rise of a major country that is very different from it in social system, history and culture, and whether it can truly respect the Chinese people's right to pursue development and a better life. We believe that so long as we respect each other's history and the cultural traditions, respect each other's core interests and major concerns, as well as each other's choice of political uh, system and development path, it is absolutely possible for our two countries to coexist in peace and prosper side by side. Third, we need to strengthen dialogue and enhance cooperation to achieve uh, mutually beneficial results. While China's development has benefited from its more than four decades of opening up and cooperation with other countries, including the United States, uh, China's development has also provided the US and other countries with an impetus 
for sustained growth and a huge market space. On balance, the trade and economic cooperation between China and the US over the years are mutually beneficial. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, bilateral trade in goods grew by 8.3% last year to exceed 580 billion US dollars. In the first quarter of this year, two-way trade surged by 61.3% year on year. At the China-US Agriculture Roundtable, which I attended this March, the participating government officials and business representatives from both sides agreed that the economic cooperation between the two sides, including that in the agricultural sector, are win-win and conducive to local economic and social development. Last month, eight rail cars assembled by Chinese company CRRC Sifang America kicked off the in-service test run in Chicago. These are, these are Chicago-made rail cars that have created hundreds of jobs for local communities and represent the return of rail car manufacturing industry to Chicago after more than five decades of absence. General Motors is another good example. Its sales in China, which is now its single largest market in the world, has exceeded that in the US for 10 straight years. It is projected that uh, China's auto market will be larger than Europe and North America combined in 2035 with huge potential. On top of this, our educational and cultural exchanges, as well as people-to-people -people contacts, have further deepened mutual understanding and friendship and expanded common interests between our two peoples, contributing to the sound development of bilateral relations. All in all, <laughs> exchanges and cooperation are an essential part of our friendship. There are more we can do together in curbing climate change, fighting pandemics, and expanding trade and economic and people-to-people -people exchanges. Ladies and gentlemen, to achieve mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation between China and the US, we also need to take an objective and rational view of the following points. Uh, first, about democracy. Uh, we Chinese are very proud of our political system, just as the Americans are proud of your own. Some have uh, labeled China as an authoritarian state, saying that there is no democracy in China. This is not true. In fact, Mr. Chen Duxiu, one of the founding members of the Communist Party of China, loudly pushed for the promotion of democracy and science in China, or Monsieur Democracy and Science, as he called them, as early as actually more than a century ago. The CPC, since day one, has taken upon itself the mission of making the Chinese people the masters of the country and achieving the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. What we have in China is socialist democracy, a whole process democracy that, em that embodies the will of the people, suits the country's realities and is endorsed by the people. For instance, when the Chinese government formulated the 14th five-year plan, public opinions were solicited from all quarters and through various channels. More than 1 million suggestions were collected on the internet alone. The surveys the Harvard University has conducted for several years running have shown that the CPC and the Chinese government have the support of the overwhelming majority of the Chinese people with an approval rating of over 90%. We believe that uh, democracy takes diverse forms and there's no one size fits all format. What matters most is whether the government's policies embody the will and the wish of the people and represent the interests of the overwhelming majority of the people. 
It is undemocratic to label China as authoritarian or dictatorship simply because its democracy takes a form quite different than that of the United States. Second, on human rights, as the largest developing country in the world, China takes a people-centered approach to human rights, giving priority to ensuring people's most fundamental rights to subsistence and development while striving for all round and coordinated development of their economic, social, cultural, as well as civil and political rights. Over the past 70 plus years, since the founding of the People's Republic, we have raised China's per capita GDP from less than 30 US dollars to over 10,000 US dollars, lifted more than 800 million people out of poverty and eliminated extreme poverty for the first time in China's thousands of years of history. Places inhabited by ethnic minorities uh, in Xinjiang, such as in China, such as Xinjiang and the Xizang, uh, that's Tibet, have stood out as shining examples of China's human rights progress. Between 1990 and 2016, Xinjiang was hit by thousands of terror attacks killing thousands of innocent people and causing heavy property losses. Thanks to the strong and proper policies adopted by the Chinese government, the region has been free from violent terrorist attacks for more than four years and regained the momentum of steady and sound development. In recent time, some Western uh, politicians and media outlets have been playing up the so-called genocide in Xinjiang. This is pure fabrication. In the past more than 60 years, Xinjiang's economy has expanded by over 200 times, with per capita GDP uh, has expanded by over 200 times, with per capita GDP growing nearly 40 times, and its average life expectancy has risen from 30 to 72 years. In the past 40 years, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang has more than doubled from 5.55 million to over 12 million. During the 80 years between 2010 and 2018, uh, the Uyghur population grew by 25%, which was not only uh, much higher than the overall population growth in the region, but also more than 10 times higher than that of the Han people in Xinjiang during the same period of time. We could not but ask, is there any genocide like this in the world? Third, about hegemony. Some accused China of seeking hegemony expansion. In fact, China is committed to a path of peaceful development that underlines peaceful coexistence and mutually beneficial cooperation with other countries. China's conventional wisdom gained from its millennia of history has it that hegemony leads to failure and a strong country should not seek hegemony. We rely on our own effort of hard work to achieve development and national rejuvenation rather than aggression or expansion. In the past more than 70 years, there is not a single instance of China provoking a war with another country or occupying an inch of foreign land. Instead, we advocate bridging differences through dialogue and diffusing disputes through negotiation and talks. We never export ideology or seek regime change in other countries. When unilateralism and protectionism ran rampant in the past few years, China stepped forward to resist the tendency uh, without any hesitation and took concrete actions to uphold the UN-centered international system and the international order underpinned by international law. As UN General Secretary General Antonio uh, Guterres put it, China has become a backbone of multilateralism and an indispensable and trustworthy force for world peace and development. Ladies and gentlemen, this year marks the 50th anniversary of China-US ping pong diplomacy. 
at the reception to welcome the Chinese table tennis team on their return visit to the US, President Nixon said that despite there being winners and losers in their table tennis tournament, the real winner will be the friendship between the people of the United States and the people of the People's Republic of China. When conducting the ping pong diplomacy 50 years ago, the Chinese side emphasized the spirit of friendship first, competition second. Maybe today we need the same spirit to guide us into the future. The future of Sino-US relations in the final analysis hinges upon the people of the two countries because without their support and contribution, no progress could be made in bilateral relations. The Chinese Consulate General in Chicago will continue to work with people of all sectors in the Midwest to further enhance mutual understanding, exchanges, and cooperation between our two sides to jointly create a brighter future for us all. Thank you. So General, thank you so much for, the, for your comments. And I apologize, but uh, Adlai Stevenson, my father, has been uh, called away, is unable to uh, participate. Do you have uh, time? I know that you have limited time. You have a, an engagement uh, soon. Do you have a time for a few questions from our audience? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. No. Um, yeah, I, 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 will, I would be quite happy to communicate uh, yeah, with the members of your center. <laughs> and may I respectfully ask, concerning the, um, the changing and dynamic situation in Hong Kong, can you give us the, the uh, Chinese perspective of what is happening uh, in Hong Kong? Yeah, um, Hong Kong is a uh, special administrative region of uh, China and uh, China resumed its exercise of sovereignty over Hong Kong uh, since uh, 1997. So our policy in Hong Kong is one country, two systems uh, to uh, 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 govern Hong Kong uh, by the Hong Kong people and uh, a high degree of autonomy. So that's the basic policy. Um, and uh, we have uh, always, uh, the Chinese government has always been uh, working very hard to promote the sustainable prosperity uh, and development in Hong Kong. But quite recent years, we have seen some of the uh, riot, uh, riotous activities in Hong Kong. There are some people who under the pretext of uh, seeking democracy and uh, liberty, were actually seeking to, uh, uh, to achieve the Hong Kong independence. And uh, they communicated with, uh, and uh, they connived with some of the, uh, the external forces. And they created a lot of uh, 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 separate activities and the riot riotous activities. And they uh, broke into the government buildings and uh, they, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, hate on those quite in innocent people who uh, did not agree with their political views. So we saw a lot of uh, you know, violence in Hong Kong. And um, that's why you know, the Hong Kong residents and the Chinese people, the Chinese government, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on the stability and uh, 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 the uh, protection of the great majority uh, citizens' uh, 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 liberty and freedom <laughs> um, uh, in the center. And we also noted that actually the problem of Hong Kong independ independence would appear uh, arises actually from a lack of national security uh, legislation in Hong Kong. I think that's unimaginable in any other parts of the world. You cannot imagine that uh, like in, in Hawaii or in Guam uh, or uh, in any other place uh, uh, of uh, uh, the, another country that uh, this piece of land would not be covered by the national security law. So that's uh, why the central government uh, worked hard to together with the um, Hong Kong SAR 
government to put in place a national security uh, legislation. And I think our policy is quite uh, clear. We would uh, uh, sincere, sincerely and very honestly and very resolutely stick to the policy of one country, two systems, and to govern the Hong Kong uh, region by the Hong Kong people and for the high degree of autonomy. But one thing is very important, Hong Kong is part of uh, uh, China. Anyone who is working in the Hong Kong SAR government, anyone uh, who is a member of the Hong Kong legislative body should be loyal to the country, to the countryside and uh, to, to, to its motherland and to the people living in Hong Kong. And uh, so that's sort of, uh, you know, the requirement of loyalty. loyalty. I think loyalty is, uh, you know, is uh, required in anywhere for any person uh, working for the government or working in the legislature in any country. So I think that's quite a common thing. Uh, and um, that's why, uh, you know, we have been working to uh, preserve, you know, the stability and the sustainable development of the Hong Kong uh, SAR. And that has been our policy uh, in Hong Kong. Actually, we also noted since the national legislation uh, security was put in place and uh, with the joint efforts of the Hong Kong ICR uh, and the, old, uh, the great majority of the citizens in Hong Kong, the situation uh, had returned to normal and uh, we were now more than ever, we are more confident than ever about uh, the continued prosperity and the development of the Hong Kong. So we believe that uh, there is an even brighter future in Hong Kong. And uh, actually, uh, if you live in Hong Kong, uh, if you support one country, two systems, if you respect other people's rights to freedom, there's nothing that you need to worry about. And um, um, so that's in that regard that, uh, you know, we are looking at the situation in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, for the Hong Kong question, we hope that, you know, you know as, Every government, every foreign government, every uh, foreign media, any political commentator should take a quite objective view about what is ha happening in Hong Kong. No double standards should be, you know, uh, applied to Hong Kong. And we also know that that uh, there are uh, tens of thousands of American citizens living in Hong Kong. There are at least more than thousands of American companies operating in. Hong Kong. I think the uh, sustained stability, development, and prosperity are really also in their interest. And uh, uh, we are now seeing that uh, the Chinese government's policy in Hong Kong has been gaining, gaining more and more support, uh, not only from the local uh, Hong Kong citizens, but uh, uh, from many of the uh, you know, foreign uh, commentators. If I may, may I transfer away from global policy and the global issues and speak a slightly more locally. Um, when you arrived in the United States, the, the United States was just entering uh, its period with uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic. Can you speak to us um, about your personal uh how that went for you, your personal move into this country and how that changed your, your uh, outreach uh, through the nine state region. Yeah, thank you. Uh, since last year, yeah, the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, has been very rampant in many parts of the world. Uh, but what we experienced in the past, you know, um, one half years almost, uh, told us once again that uh, we are living in a, a globalized village. The COVID-19 uh, virus is the common enemy of the whole humanity. Uh, it could hate China, it could hate the United States, it could hate any parts of the world. 
uh, in this globalized world, faced with this uh, the, the challenge, no single country can address it just by itself. Uh, in that regard, we believe and um, we always maintain that all countries should stand together and work together to show our solidarity and to engage in cooperation. Otherwise, there's no way that the human society could really defeat the virus. Uh, we still remember that uh, earlier last year, at the beginning of last year, when China was hit very hard by the virus, we received a lot of uh, very precious support and assistance uh, from many circles of the society of America. A lot of American people, ordinary citizens, NGOs, American companies, uh, different institution, institutes uh, rendered uh, various support to the Chinese people. We were really very thankful to that. And a few, you know, uh, when later, later when the uh, virus became very, the situation became very serious in the United States, the Chinese government and the Chinese people were also very quick to respond to the fight in the US against the virus. The Chinese people, many of the Chinese companies, many of the Chinese uh, provinces and cities, they uh, the, worked very hard to provide some support, to provide some PPEs and other uh, uh, the support to the American people. I think that showed the solidarity and the uh, cooperation in our fight against the virus. Uh, today, we are very pleased to see that, uh, 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 you know, in the United States, uh, there, there's really a very important progress in the past few uh, months in COVID-19 progress. We really feel happy uh, for our American friends. But, uh, you know, the situation is still quite serious in many parts of the world. And uh, as two major countries, uh, I think we should work together, not only to help uh, the, our two peoples, but also to help the people in other parts of the world. There are really a lot, a lot of things that we can work together. Actually, ever since the very beginning of the breakup of, uh, uh, of the uh, pandemic, <coughs> pandemic uh, earlier last year, China was very weak, to, was very rapid, to uh, 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 communicate with uh, uh, the American side uh, in uh, science and in uh, uh, medical studies, uh, in uh, finding, you know, exploring the most effective ways uh, for cure and for the uh, prevention of the spreading of the virus. We shared uh, our uh, information uh, at the you know, first possible opportunities uh, to our American uh, friends uh, in uh, the, the medical uh, uh, area uh, about the, you know, the, the we, when we separated uh, the pathogen, when we uh, um, uh, uh, sequenced the uh, genome, and we shared all those information to the American side. And, uh, you know, we have been uh, in very, uh, uh, good communication with the uh, WHO. Uh, uh, and we always believe, you know, that uh, in the uh, fight against the virus, um, uh, both China and the US should work together with the uh, World Health Organization and to provide more support, uh, uh, to provide uh, technological and fund support to other countries. And we should share our experience. Uh, we should share our knowledge. And we should work together in sharing more like vaccines, uh, more you know, uh, uh, medical knowledge about this to uh, other people. So that's uh, what um, uh, my <clears throat> opinion about that. I know there are some commentators uh, criticizing China on the COVID. 19, but I think, and that's also uh, the view of uh, many of the political leaders of many countries and uh, the opinions of many scientists and the medical staff. That is that uh, the COVID-19 is, is an enemy 
of the humanity. humanity. It could hate China, it could hate the United States, and uh, it could be, you know, <clears throat> um, uh, hating on anyone in the world. And of course, we need to uh, 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 work together to uh, uh, find um, the origin of the virus, but we need to listen to the scientists. We should respect the work of the scientists, of the medical and the medical staff. There were some politicians, you know, spreading the lies as that uh, the virus uh, came out of, was leaked from some uh, labs in China. I think that's total uh, fabricated uh, stories. That has been uh, uh, denied and negated by the experts and scientists from the WHO and from other uh, scientific uh, institutes. And uh, we should uh, work together to uh, uh, do, you know, further study in that regard, but we must respect science. Um, political motives should not dictate the direction, should not dictate the work of the uh, WHO, and uh, should, we should not be misled by some, uh, you know, uh, misinformation or, you know, fabricated uh, stories. Thank you, Council General, for your edifying uh, and encouraging remarks. Unless, uh, uh, well, uh, I had one question. Yeah, you emphasize, as I do, the importance of uh, cooperation, but uh, that's the uh, complaint. The, with respect to the Uyghurs and other minorities uh, in, in uh, China, relationship uh, with, uh, the, you know, Hong Kong is, uh, causes uh, questions. So cooperation takes, takes two. And we at the Stevenson Center are, uh, eager to uh, improve cooperation. So if there's ever anything that uh, we can do for you to help you, or if you have any advice for us, please don't hesitate to and you know be in touch with, with us. And with that, uh, unless someone else has remarks, um, we thank you again and uh, adjourn the meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Senator. Uh, nowadays, there were a lot of uh, talk about the situation uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, Xinjiang is an autonomous region in, um, in China, in the uh, northwest part of China. Xinjiang, you know, the, uh, there are the, uh, a lot of uh, ethnic groups living in Xinjiang. About half of them uh, are Uyghur people, uh, the Uyghur population. And then there are other ethnic minorities, the Hazakistan and the other uh, Muslims, and also the Han people living there. Xinjiang has been part of the Chinese territory for uh, many, many years since ancient times. And um, together you know, with other parts of China since the founding of the People's Republic of uh, China, we have been able to see the continued economic growth uh, in Xinjiang. But uh, for some period between, I think mid 1990s and uh, uh, 2010 or 20. Uh, 15 something, uh, there was also the situation uh, where the, uh, the, the, the terrorism, the extremism, extremism and the separatism were spreading uh, quite quickly in Xinjiang. I think it coincides with the spread of uh, the uh, terrorist uh, elements in other parts of the world like that in the United uh, States. <laughs> And those terrorist forces 
uh, whose aim um, was to separate Xinjiang from China, and whose aim was to, you know, to promote their uh, so so called mission together with other uh, the the terrorist forces in Afghanistan and in Syria. Um, they worked hard to create a uh, sort of uh, you know uh, trouble uh, in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So to respond to the people's uh, request, the Chinese government uh, adopted uh, quite uh, effective policies in Xinjiang. We, I think, first, uh, the government worked very hard to fight terrorism. Uh, those terrorist forces, they were uh, in conspiration uh, with uh, the Islamic, uh, the uh, IS, uh, with uh, the Taliban, and they were creating a lot of uh, terrorist attacks in Xinjiang, killing thousands of people, uh, innocent people, killing the people of, you know, not only of the Han ethnicity, but also the Uyghur people. So the government uh, struck hard on those terrorist forces. And uh, we also realized that, uh, you know, uh, you need to fight against terrorism, terrorism, but you also need to uh, remove the root uh, of the, you know, the terrorism breeding ground. So poverty is one of the uh, problems there. And uh, so the government worked very hard to help the people uh, to improve their uh, livelihood, to create more uh, employment opportunities, and to establish, uh, you know, set up more industrial uh, like uh, the uh, factories uh, and to create more employment. Um, and there were also some people, especially some young people who were uh, influenced by those uh, terrorist uh, forces who were influenced or misguided by those extremist uh, forces. They took part in some of those uh, terrorist attacks and they committed some quite minor uh, crimes. So for those people, uh, the government did not just simply, you know, uh, put them into prison or other things to punish them. But uh, actually, uh, the, the government uh, uh, put in place measures to help them uh, return to uh, the normal social life, help them return to the society. That's why we have, uh, uh, you know, in the past years established uh, quite some uh, vocational education and training centers where the young people could learn uh, the knowledge about law, could learn the uh, vocational skills, and they could, uh, many people, you know, many of the Uyghur people, they could not uh, uh, speak uh, Mandarin, and they can only speak like uh, the Uyghur uh, dialect. And uh, so the, the, the vocational training centers also help them uh, learn the, uh, uh, the Mandarin, uh, which is, you know, commonly uh, used in China, in the whole country, just like, uh, you know, a, a new uh, immigrant in America uh, might be required to learn English. So that's what we have been doing uh, in Xinjiang. I think with those kind of uh, policies um, to fight uh, very decisively against terrorism and also to help people understand uh, better about the situation to help people uh, 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 remove poverty and help people improve their living standards. The situation were greatly improved in Xinjiang. In the past four years, there has been no single terrorist attacks in Xinjiang. And the people of all ethnic groups, they were able to live uh, once again, the happy and the very free life in Xinjiang. I think that's what the people really uh, need, what the people really like. Some people were uh, telling those lies of uh, genocide, of so-called genocide, or the crimes against uh, uh, humanity, humanity in Xinjiang. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, 
very ridiculous. As I mentioned, the population of Xinjiang over the past uh, uh, 40, uh, uh, 40 years, the population uh, grew from like, I mean, more than doubled. I mean, the Uyghur population are more than doubled. From the year 2010 to 2018, the Uyghur population increased by uh, about two, uh, about uh, more than two point, about 2.5 million. It's an increase of 25%. And the, you know, the growth rate uh, was much higher than uh, 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 the P, the population of other ethnic groups in Xinjiang, of course, is more than the 10 times higher than the growth of the Han population in Xinjiang. So if you look at those facts, uh, you can never see any uh, trace of uh, uh, genocide. And uh, some people were talking about uh, the forced labor and the Xinjiang uh, people, the Uyghur people and the people of other ethnic groups, yeah, they want to find good jobs. Uh, the jobs in their local communities, in their own cities, in, in Xinjiang, and also in other parts of the world. I know that uh, many of the Xinjiang, the Uyghur people and other people, they went to Guangdong, to Guangzhou, and to Shanghai to find uh, well, better paid jobs. I think that's their choice. That's their freedom. Some people, you know, were criticizing China on the so-called uh, forced labor, but you don't need to force the people to work because every people want to create. Every person want to create a better life for himself, for his family through hard work, through you know, working agricultural sector, in industrial sector, or in commerce and trade. I think there's that's their freedom. That's they're right. You cannot just uh, uh, deprive these people of, the, of their right to seek better livelihood. Uh, there are so many um, lies about uh, uh, the situation in Xinjiang. Actually, many of the story just originate from just a small group of uh, very biased uh, uh, scholars and uh, uh, media people. Um, there was so one so-called scholar called uh, named uh, uh, Adrian Zanz, who lives in uh, Germany, uh, who himself was a you know uh, the the right extremist, and he has very uh, close uh, link uh, with some of the, uh, the rightist groups here in the United States, and his so-called study about Xinjiang was funded by some um, uh, political groups which are strongly biased uh, against China. And actually those scholars study uh, have proved to be just lies. Uh, quite, quite recently, there are a lot of uh, 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 journalists and political commentators in, uh, uh, in Sweden, in Germany, uh, in Europe, other parts of Europe, in Asia, and even in the United States and in Canada, uh, they were, you know, telling the society that uh, many of the lies against the Chinese government, and uh, they were, you know, speaking um, um, uh, the, the, against those lies, those fabricated uh, stories. And uh, actually, in the past few years, uh, there were uh, more than 1,000 foreign diplomats, foreign officials, foreign journalists, and even some, uh, uh, some people, a lot of people from the religious, the Muslim uh, uh, groups uh, from Middle East, uh, they visited Xinjiang. And after their visit, they all gave quite objective uh, uh, description uh, about uh, what they have uh, seen in Xinjiang. And uh, we welcome every friend to visit Xinjiang to see through their own eyes what it is like in Xinjiang. And um, we will continue to work hard to uh, further promote the economic development in Xinjiang and to create even better life for uh, as many people as 
possible. Um, but we would, uh, you know, welcome the quite objective, uh, you know, uh, the uh, comments on Xinjiang. So uh, we hope that, uh, you know, we would be able to tell a quite uh, true story about uh, uh, the situation in Xinjiang. Um, there are also a small, very small group of people, uh, you know, uh, some people might call them dissidents who were not happy about the Chinese government's rule in Xinjiang. And so they are part of uh, those uh, uh, the, the, the fabricated stories. And they themselves, they uh, came out and uh, uh, tell some lies uh, about uh, something in Xinjiang. And uh, many of them have uh, proved to be yeah just, just lies. So that's um, what uh, I know about uh, 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 about Xinjiang. And another thing I also want to mention is that uh, the, the question about Xinjiang, you know, those Xinjiang related matters is not about democracy, it's not about religious freedom, uh, it's not about human rights, it's about fighting against terrorism. And actually, there are now more than 10, 20, there are more than 20,000 Muslim mosques in Xinjiang. Uh, there's one Muslim mosque for every, for about 500 Muslims in Xinjiang. I think there are more Muslim mosques uh, than that in the United States. So some people were talking about a lack of uh, uh, religious freedom. Uh, that's, that's not true. I also want to mention actually, um, uh, the essence of the situation in Xinjiang about, is about fighting uh, terrorism. But uh, when we realize the problem of uh, terrorism in Xinjiang. Uh, what we did is, as I mentioned, uh, first to fight against the terrorist attacks and uh, second to help further improve the local economy, to improve the people's living standards. We didn't vent the anger, the indignation upon all the Muslim groups. And uh, actually I still remember after nine, 11, China and the United States, we worked together to fight against terrorism. We supported the US initiative. We supported the US government's fight uh, against uh, terrorism. Uh, there were also um, the, uh, the facts that um, many of those terrorist forces uh, looking and working in Xinjiang were once trained in Middle East, in Afghanistan, in Syria by the uh, IS. And uh, many, many uh, years ago, uh, those uh, prisoners, you know, uh, imprisoned in uh, uh, Guantanamo, uh, some of them were actually uh, Uyghur people from Xinjiang. And uh, as recently as just uh, two or three years ago, the United Nations uh, uh, proved that uh, there were thousands of, uh, you know, uh, the Uyghur people, uh, they were fighting uh, in uh, Syria. So these are the facts proving that, you know, terrorism is a serious concern, not only for China, but also for the wider international community. In the fight against uh, terrorism, there should be no double standards and uh, we should always uh, work together. Uh, otherwise, we would not be able to accomplish uh, our goal of removing um, terrorism uh, in the world. Thank you.